Hello, this is David Tuchel, Raman Application Scientist at Hariba Scientific, and in this video I would like to discuss with you laser wavelength selection and avoiding fluorescence when acquiring a Raman spectrum. So in consideration of laser wavelength selection, let's start with the fundamentals. First is that the peak positions and relative intensities of an ordinary or normal Raman spectrum are independent of the laser wavelength. And so whether you're using 532 nanometer excitation or 632.8 or 785 or 404, 405 nanometers, the Raman spectrum that you generate should be the same as long as you're not in resonance. That is to say that there's no transition from the ground to the excited electronic state when using this laser excitation. And what I'm referring here to are the peak positions, that is to say those Raman band shifts, and the intensities of the peaks relative to each other within the spectrum. That is to say that they will, they should be the same no matter what excitation wavelength you use. And that's again for a non-resonant Raman spectrum. Now having said that, the overall Raman scattering intensity will be stronger with shorter wavelength excitation. Where the laser excitation here, I'm uh, using the symbol lambda, lambda to describe that. The overall intensity, meaning the intensity of each of the Raman bands is given by the letter I. And so the entire Raman spectrum will be stronger and proportional to the quantity 1 over lambda to the fourth power or the excitation frequency to the fourth power. So the shorter the excitation wavelength that you use, the more intense the Raman scattering will be. Now this is all independent of uh, your um, uh, spectrometer optics and the CCD sensitivity. I'm basically just talking about the chemical physics here of Raman scattering. So now let's consider some of those experimental conditions for a Raman spectrum where if you do choose an excitation wavelength such that it matches an excitation transition or an absorption manifold you then can achieve resonance conditions and then the Raman uh, intensities of some bands uh, will vary and will depend on that excitation wavelength. Now that's a topic for another video, but that does play a role in selecting uh, a laser wavelength. Furthermore, you want to make sure that your laser wavelength matches the hardware efficiencies of, say for example, your CCD, grading, mirrors and lenses, that is to say their dependencies on uh, wavelength and the efficiencies as a function of wavelength. And finally, one of the things to consider in selecting an excitation wavelength is avoiding the fluorescence background, which is a topic for this video. Now, let's consider this molecular energy diagram uh, as a way to understand Raman scattering and fluorescence together. So if we think about a molecule interacting with an incident laser photon and uh, then consider the Ro Stokes Raman scattering case here, what you have is when that incident photon is at an energy less than an electronic energy transition, then there is no absorption. The molecule is transparent, if you will, to that wavelength. Nevertheless, uh, with the interaction of that photon with the molecule, the molecule achieves what's called a virtual state whereupon energy can be transferred from the incident photon to the molecule and a second photon is scattered such that that second photon has an energy less than the incident photon by an amount equal to the quantum of energy that was transferred. That is to say the photon is scattered at lower energy, longer wavelength, and the molecule ends up in the first excited vibrational state. Now that's normal Raman scattering. What happens however if you use an excitation wavelength that's of shorter wavelength, higher energy, such that you drive the molecule into the first excited electronic state? 
Well, resonance Raman spectroscopy is one possibility, but that's a topic for another video. What definitely happens quite frequently under those uh, conditions is that after absorption has occurred, the molecule can then relax down to the ground vibrational state in the or, uh, ground vibrational state of the first excited electronic state, whereupon a photon is emitted. That's a fluorescence photon, and then the uh, electron drops back down to the ground electronic state. And now what you have is an emission that is competing, a fluorescence emission that's competing with the Raman scattering. And that is one of the reasons for selecting an excitation wavelength to avoid this kind of fluorescence. And so you want to avoid this kind of uh, absorption and subsequent emission uh, as a result. So let's kind of uh, put this together now in uh, considering spectra, Raman spectra. Well, spectra consi consisting of both Raman scattering and fluorescence plotted in different ways. Now, Raman spectra are plotted as Raman shift in wave numbers relative to the excitation. Uh, frequency or excitation wave number, which is always defined as zero. So whatever the excitation wavelength is, that will be defined as zero in, in your Raman spectrum on a Raman shift scale. So the Raman shift is basically equal to the wave number of the absolute wave number of the Raman band subtracted from the absolute wave number, that is to say one over the wavelength of the excitation light and uh, and then that's uh, plotted, the intensity as a function of that Raman shift is plotted and so you get a spectrum that consists of your peaks, your Raman bands that you see here and these three spectra were acquired with three different excitation wavelengths, they're color coded so the green spectrum was obtained with 532 nanometer excitation, the red with 633 and the dark red with 785 so you see that the Raman peaks are at the same Raman shift. Again, it doesn't matter what uh, excitation wavelength you're using, but the backgrounds are different. And what are these backgrounds due to? Well, that's due to the fluorescence, which we can clearly see if we take these same spectra plotted to the left and plot them on an absolute wavelength scale in nanometers. So here are our Raman bands which appear at different absolute wavelengths, which they should because they're all shifted relative to the absolute wavelength of the laser light. And what we see is that laser excitation is being absorbed and uh, there is a subsequent emission. And so you see the fluorescence background extending through all of these three spectra. And so as you move to longer excitation wavelength, you're moving away from the excitation or absorption manifold and getting less and less fluorescence uh, or emission in your Raman spectrum. We can look at another set of three spectra, or that is to say spectra that were acquired from a different compound, a more fluorescent compound. And again, in the upper left hand corner we're plotting all three spectra on absolute wavelength scale. So to reiterate fluorescence is going to be wavelength dependent that is to say depending on where we excite we're going to get more or less uh, fluorescence uh, depending on the excitation wavelength relative to that electronic set transition or absorption manifold. The Raman scattering is wavelength independent. Okay, so in this compound we see more and more fluorescence as we move from 532 to 633 excitation and then it diminishes where we see no fluorescence at all when excited at 785. Here we're plotting these same spectra on a Raman shift scale and so you can very clearly see how the fluorescence is obscuring the Raman scattering. Now how does it do that? Well, the fluorescence is of course being detected at the same absolute wavelengths as is the Raman scattering by the detector and that very strong fluorescence signal that you see at 633 contributes then to the noise in the detector.
and if the fluorescent te intensity is so strong that the noise it generates can be comparable to that of the Raman scattering, which is an inherently weak uh, phenomenon. And so these bands that you see very nicely at 785 nanometer excitation are obscured, certainly in the 633 nanometer excited spectrum, we only see the most intense peak, whereas all these other peaks are all diminished and they're basically lost and buried in the noise. That is the problem with the fluorescence in acquiring Raman spectra. So if we plot these same spectra uh, separately now, I think you can see clearly if we excite at 532, we're just on the onset of the fluorescence. You can still see the Raman bands there and you could certainly uh, uh, using the software do a background subtraction. However, once you get to 633 nanometer excitation, even a background uh, subtraction won't help because the bands themselves are lost in the noise, whereas at 785 nanometer excitation, we're removed from the, the fluorescence altogether, and so we get a very good signal-to-noise uh, in our Raman spectrum. So the point here is that the right laser wavelength selection is key to avoiding fluorescence. And so I hope that uh, with our discussion today, you have a better idea of the problem of fluorescence in Raman spectroscopy. And one way to avoid that is through the uh, proper selection of the excitation wavelength.